Welcome to our sixth module in this uh, introduction to uh, continual improvement. This is titled Applying Situational Awareness to Define Issues. Now, notice I'm not saying problems, I'm saying issues. And we'll come back to why we are identifying the issue as the initial concern. So first of all, I'd like you to think about how this happens in the cartoons with Spider-Man. Now you might remember, Spider-Man is hanging on the side of a building and he gets this spidey sense. It's a tingling in the back of his head that's saying there's something wrong. And it's actually a very important power. So he gets this small tingling and it provides him with this heightened sense of awareness. I need to look out there. What's happening here? Where is, what's going on? I know something is wrong. There's an issue. I don't know what the problem is. I can't define the problem but I know something is not normal. And then what he's gonna do is he's gonna combine situational awareness, the tingly feeling. There's something unusual with sense making. How does he make sense out of that to find out what is the situation that requires his attention? Now he's noticing things other people don't. He's recognizing meaning in the street noise. And he sees this something unusual implying something is not right and he needs to focus and concern himself with what is that thing that's not right. He'll focus on that issue, drill down, and as he gets to the details of the sensation experience that he's getting, he uncovers the problem. And this is what happens. The law of the situation is that we are faced with what we can observe and then we have to make perception. We have to understand and process that to get to some knowledge of there is something going on here that we need to do something different about. So the mantra of process improvement happens in a collaborative work environment, not just the mental power of an individual, but the mental power of a team joined together in a combined thinking process. So first, what they wanna do is streamline the flows. Design the work so it flows without delay from one end of the process to the other. And then in that process, reduce the waste. Get rid of the unnecessary activity and reduce the losses that occur because of that waste. And they also want to improve quality. Increase the quality of the supplied material, the inputs, or the way work is accomplished, the craftsmanship of the job. And then standardize everything so there is one best way of doing this. So this mantra tells us what should be done. Now the question is, how do we do it? What's the way we actually apply our thinking processes, methods, or tools to achieve this process improvement approach? So first we have to understand this issue or the concern. Do our customers believe that the things we deliver to them meet the agreed upon performance targets? So first, we have to define what are the symptoms? What was detected? When was it detected? Where was it detected? Who detected it? And why is this considered critical to the customer? Then we have to identify the initial scope of the project. What was the organization involved? Is there some geographic region or of interest where this happened? Are there some constraints due to the system? How about team or resource constraints? So we may need to expand or contract the scope of the problem later on to find the root cause of the issue. But the presenting issue that we have, the circumstances that have created this spidey sense, if you will, that something is not quite right, can tell us where to begin. Then we have to start considering practicalities. So the practicality is, do we have good data? How often do we operate the process? Or how often can we see new data about the way the process is performing? Have we isolated the problem to a particular area or geography or a piece of equipment? Or are there several functions or regions involved? And this determines that who needs to be part of the team, who's gonna be reviewed, who's gonna take action, who will the decision maker be? Now, the issue can be described as a problem narrative. And, and the problem narrative is about the story, if you will, about the situation. And, and in this, I go back to a, a poem that was written in 1902 by Rudyard Kipling. 
And he, it, it goes like this. It said, I keep six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when and how and where and who. So these questions help us to organize thinking about this issue, problem, or concern. And so this is sometimes called the 5W2H method in Japan. It's used by Toyota executives even to define problems. And it says, what happened? Who was there? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? How did it happen? And how much happened? Now, these rules are also used in journalism schools to teach a reporter how to do investigative reporting. The story is identified by the six honest servings men, these questions. Once you've answered the questions, it's just a matter of arranging the prose so you tell the good story around that. And you've got then the complete story that makes the news article. So are there some constraints around the issues we have? So the system of constraints, there can be different sources. So there can be technological or physical constraints in the system. Uh, one of the constraints might be it's happening in this building or it's only happening at this particular place. Or maybe there's a technology, it happens with this type of computer system or that type of cell phone system, but not with others. Is it a process or a human-based constraints that we see different people performing and having different results for the same basic tasks? Are there standards, legal, or regulatory constraints? So for instance, I'm looking at the courts Every court is establishing its own set of operating rules or principles by which it works, and some of those rules may differ from one court to the next. So do the standards differ? Standards differ from industry to industry. And even how we implement basic standards like ISO 9000 will change as a function of the application for that system which we're dealing with. So, we want to clear, uh, have clear issues that are operationally defined. So what is an operational definition? Well, this concept also goes back <clears throat> to Percy Bridgman in his Logic of Modern Physics. And he says that what we need to do is to describe the objective measurable characteristics that unambiguously characterize work features or performance factors that are significant in a particular process or investigation. So this common language is how we are going to communicate about what's going to be measured, the boundaries of the problems, the rational subgroups that we have that are important. So is it important for us to analyze suppliers' differences, equipment differences, people differences? And then what is the time dimension on which we're actually going to be taking a look at this? From when to when? At what period do we see interest of observing the system. So the purpose of the operational definition is to remove ambiguity and assure everyone has the same degree of understanding or common language about the measurements. And it provides a clear approach to process measurement. We identify what to measure, the limits of the measurement, and we assure that the results are repeatable and reproducible. So repeatable means if I measure it a second time, I get the same results. Reproducible means if I measure it someplace else, I will get also related results. Now, we formalize the issue statement. So we have to first identify what's the issue. What is it that's out of control? What is this unusual thing our spidey sense has detected? So we have to specify what's the indicator that we had. And then we have to say, what's the current state or the level of performance? What's the desired level of performance? And then the gap is the nature of the problem. We have to evaluate the elements involved in this issue. So who is it affecting? What would be the outcome if it's not corrected? Where is it taking place? Is this a, a limited process? It's happening only at one instance of, of the physical process flow. And when does it need to be fixed? Is there a sense of urgency about which we have to do? Things will fall apart. We'll have excessive uh, cost happening if we don't fix this now. Why is it important for this particular thing to get corrected or fixed? And then we can define the issue as a problem statement. So we specify the objective characteristic that needs improvement. So 
what are we going to do? Are we going to reduce performance, increase performance, or control a outcome of a particular performance indicator or measure? Where are we going to do that? At what location do we do that? And so we can start moving this into a more concrete world where we can actually have a team go and do this investigation. So we think about an issue statement. We want to have a, a little reflection again on this. So all organizations have issues that need to be addressed. Of all the current issues facing your organization, what is the one that is pervasive and is affecting the most employees? How can you make it clearer so it can be crystallized into a problem statement and then addressed by a project for improvement? So first step here is agree on the specific situations. We should use this 5W2H method to identify what's going on and share that in the team. Get agreement about what is the issue. Follow the structure in the next slide that we're going to talk about here to define the formal issue statement and then assess how this process encourages focused thinking that will drive improvement. So we have this situation. So here is a, a, a graphic that shows uh, how we do issue analysis. So first we have the issue statement. This is the statement to be resolved. Second, which customers are affected by this? Third, what are the customer considerations? What is the customer requirement? So what is the benefit the customers are expecting? What are the features or functions that are specific to this actionable issue that we're driving? And then what are our ideas for improvement? And how did we uh, develop a prioritization for attacking the problem? Is it an SDCA problem, standardized do check act, basic daily management, or is it beyond the capability of a frontline team to make the improvement on their own? They need to have additional resources or decision rights to actually drive this into improvement and therefore it needs to be a more formal PDCA improvement project. Now, when we start confronting this problem, we have a, a seven-step process that we can go through. First, we have to select the issue we're going to focus on, identify the customer, describe the goal of the customer and the goal of the process, measure our results, determine the gap between what we measure and the goal, assess the capability, how far can improvement of this process take us, that's the process capability analysis, and then we can define the problem. And as we're looking at what we have achieved on our performance over time, we see, well, what's changed since the past when it was working acceptably? When did it change? Did something else change at that time? Was there a change in the system, a change in our recipe for working, a change in standard work performance, maybe a change in people working in the process? Why did it change? How did that change affect our customers? What was their input? And then how does it affect our productivity and our cost? So these are all things that are important for us to be able to develop the problem statements. Now, good news is that if we've done the EDA, we actually have lots of information to create the problem statement. We have a performance measure, quantitative measure. We have a key performance indicator agreed by management. We can achieve the goal uh, based on successful completion of a project to move us from this, if you will, uh, observe state towards the Bob state, towards the wow, uh, away from the wow state. So we know the direction we want to move in. We know what we'd like to see consistently over time. And the degree of inconsistent we see from the Bob state is telling us how much improvement is available. Now, we can actually make judgments about that, but we need to do a little bit more analysis to do it. But the first thing is, if we are not having the best day every day, improvement is possible. And we have to understand, what does it take to have the best day of performance that we've observed every day that we're performing that process? So the desired direction of change, we understand from the measure, what do we need to do with it? Increase, reduce, or control? We can see this desired amount of change, the desired change, based on the targets that come out of the capability analysis. The targets help to establish management's expectations for outcomes or results the project will achieve. And then the location, is, there's location in two dimensions. One is the time limit 
for making performance improvement. By studying the history, we see how rapidly the process changes and we can understand what is a reasonable time limit to make change in the future. And then we can also focus on their organization or the process, where that change needs to happen. So the problem statement does not include a target level uh, for desired performance. It doesn't say improve it by this much. It just says improve this. And it doesn't tell you what to do. So it doesn't say improve this 50% by introducing this software system. So targets are set after the process. Capability has to be defined first. And so we have to begin the investigation before we can actually set targets for the achievable performance improvements. So we have to empower the team to define the problems properly. So Phil Crosby said, problems be problems. And so it's just like we produce children that look an awful lot like us. Problems breed problems that look an awful lot like the original problem. The lack of a disciplined method of openly attacking them breeds even more problems. Why? Because we are just doing this on an ad hoc basis. We are not structurally eliminating those problems from the vocabulary of the organization or the performance of the work we're doing. So proper def definition of our problem also requires multiple perspectives. We have to look at that issue that we have from different angles, from the customer angle, from a management angle, from a worker angle, from a supplier angle. And problems should stand out from the context. They should be clearly different from history and reflect something more than a chance occurrence that this observed effect happened purely by coincidence. We want to understand the reasons for the patterns. And the magnitude of a problem is, re is the relative difference of this observed event from an expected event. And we can actually represent this using what's called a chi-squared statistic. So a chi-squared statistic is a ratio of the observed to the actual or observed to estimated, actual to approve, uh, to predicted, actual to plan, or results to target. The pragmatic interpretation shows that performance indicator uh, is, is compared to the performance expected. So if the de desired performance is two, two units, the actual performance is three, then we're three times better than predicted. But if the desired performance is six and the actual performance is two, then we're only performing to one third of the desired. And this gives us a rough estimate of the magnitude of the problem. So after we've done this, we need to staff the project team. So who is going to be put on this to attack the problem? And the team, does, it depends on the type of problem, the skills necessary to attack the problem, the time commitment involved, and the availability of the people who have the particular capabilities that you need. So <clears throat> developing a problem statement is the next thing that we'd like to do. So we need to understand the issue, and then from that, take a look at the data and create the problem statement. So think about in your organization, one pressing problem that is fundamental to your organization's long-term success. For instance, it could be something that is epidemic, in other words, the ability to perform standard work or to find better ways that those standards may be followed. We don't have a good daily management system. That's an epidemic. <clears throat> we might also have instances. So I might just have a case of lack of standard work in a particular area. So the activity we would go through with the team is, what's the desired state of the problem? How can it be measured or observed objectively? What is the current state of the problem? How big is the gap between the current and desired state? How widespread is the scope of this problem? And then using the form that's on the next page, we can create a problem statement and check it against the guidelines presented previously. So the problem statement is, what do we want to do? Here's the measure. Is this measure bigger than, you know, increase it? Nominal is best, smaller is better. And so what we want to do then is the opposite effect. Increase performance, move it towards a bigger is better. Reduce performance, move it towards smaller is better. Control it, nominal is best. Where? What is the process step? What is the geographic location? Who are the people involved? So that's the location. Scope, how big is the problem? And the mission or the project goal is, what do we want to do about this? 
what is motivating us to create the enthusiasm in the workers to dedicate themselves to working on that particular issue. So we want to have a succinct problem statement that comes out of this. But to get there first, we had to do that issue analysis. That's which will be helped by conducting the exploratory data analysis to give us this feedback or the input about what's happening in the real world situation. So thank you very much for this lecture and we're gonna come back and talk about responsibility management.